Good? Perfect. Um, I think this is the last plenary of OEB 17, at least on my schedule. Don't know about yours. Um, we're happy to welcome you here. We have three fantastic speakers um, on the strategies for the incorporation of open education. Um, and just a quick intro, and then we'll jump right into three presentations, um, after which we will have the chance to do a 30-minute round of discussion with you folks as well. Um, so open has many shades, from, from what I can tell. Um, Robin Peel and Jeffrey Pomeranz claimed in 2016 that it has 50 shades at least. Um, and I think so does institutional strategy. Um, content, technology, infrastructure, pedagogy, all that weaves into both strategy and open. And um, we're really looking forward to, to hear what you have to say on that from your own context, I think, because open and strategy always are contextual as well. Um, so a warm welcome to our speakers. We have to my left um, Ada Pellet. She is the rector of the University of Hagen in Germany, uh, which is, I think it's fair to say, the public distance education provider in Germany. Um, to her left, we have Larry Cooperman, who's the associate dean for open education at UCI Irvine. And we have Myron Sisden, and I hope I did it some justice. Perfect. Um, who's the president and founder of eLearning Journeys Initiative, and we'll hear about that a bit later on. Um, but first, Larry, I think you'll, you'll start us off with your presentation. My slides? Um, I'm actually... Do we have oh, look at that. And so how do we make them advance? <laughs> let's, get, let's get first things first. Is, is there a clicker? Or I do I just say next? I think we have one. I didn't even bother to ask. I have water. Okay. It's on its way. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's a great slide that we're on here anyway, so we'll just keep it there. So what I want to do is, um, are we going to stand up or, yeah? Sure. Yeah. So what I want to do is take a high level view of the issue of strategy for uh, different uh, kinds of organizations. And I want to start from the idea that there are, by this point, although the open education is too new to have traditions, I'd like to suggest that there are some traditional benefits that people are used to uh, inferring uh, in terms of uh, implementation of open education. And that would be uh, number one, the reduction in textbook costs or reduction in costs more broadly, doesn't have to be textbooks, an increase in quality of educational materials, uh, the idea that uh, publishing things openly allows uh, for greater innovation within an organization, and uh, as well sort of increasing participation, uh, specifically that would be in terms of a, uh, a general educational benefit over a whole of society, in the same way that distance learning led to a, an explosion of participation rates because it's too difficult to build new physical universities every week. We saw that explosion occur as a result of distance learning, and open education offers that same benefit, and even more broadly, because it's free. And so basically, I want to look at things from the standpoint of government, business, and education, both K-12 and higher education. So first of all, with governments, they're looking for specific things. And governments get very excited by uh, reducing costs, especially as they become challenged with budgets. They've looked at open education and a related phenomena of MOOCs, and they've looked at the idea of saying, well, if we can provide educational resources very broadly, we can reduce costs, therefore we can do more with less money. It's not always the case, but they, it's very attractive to them for that reason. But there are other reasons, uh, including especially with um, smaller countries, that preserving language and culture is important. And textbook publishers uh, are, won't be the ones who are producing all of the necessary texts in a minor language. And so all of a sudden, OER begins to play that role 
uh, for governments of assembling a set of resources for K-12 education up to higher education, but that essentially allows people to become educated in their first language. And so I know many of you in the audience have more than one language, and you probably switch to your native language when you want to watch a movie, because it's just everything becomes easier. Well, it's the same with K-12 as well, that having materials available in native languages, and I've seen places like, like Haiti where students are forced into French, which is not the household language, and, and so there's literacy problems at the level of the first language, and then there's a reluctance by students, even in higher education, to participate because of a felt uh, inadequacy in French. So uh, finally then, this whole idea for government as well, and I just heard the talk here uh, right before lunch, uh, is re increasing participation rates. So it's a very important goal for governments. Uh, often it's the 40% goal that of the entire population, 40% will be able to uh, uh, have some kind of uh, post-secondary credential. And to get there, open education becomes a vehicle for governments in terms of that. These are just broad strategies. I can go into uh, details later. I would say on workforce preparation, which you would think is a natural, the U.S. government spent $2 billion over four years, during the Obama years, obviously, um, but it would, to produce OERs that would help people at community colleges enter the workforce, so in the most needed areas. But it was done without a real coordination between the Department of Labor and the Department of Education, so the end result was $2 billion spent they're just now getting things ready in a repository, in the Merlot repository, in a special place. And they're trying to make sense of what were 400 or more disparate projects that were built with different technologies, different formats, and with no sense of open educational resources or potentially other audiences who might need it. So we've spent $2 billion, but perhaps not so wisely. But Workforce preparation remains an important goal of governments. So higher education also has a variety of strategies. Reduction of, co of textbook costs is actually the single most important one for most uh, universities as well as governments. So in, the, in California, the California community colleges have a zero textbook cost degree program. Um, uh, the idea is that Students spend more on textbooks than on tuition in the community colleges. Uh, as well, um, the University of Maryland, the University College, UMUC, produced, uh, has replaced all of their cost, four cost textbooks with free resources, 90% of which are OERs. So that's an amazing, uh, uh, an amazing step forward. Uh, and they did it because they actually, if you look at the backstory, the U.S. military, which uh, funds a lot of uh, members of the military to attend that college, said, we don't want any costs on our, uh, on our service members at your university, or else you might lose our business. And so they went full OER, 10% uh, free, I would say, still. 90% OER. Um, but also some, uh, for your higher education, the service mission is important. And so the service mission means that we have to produce a benefit for our communities. And so OER is a way of actually um, fulfilling the service mission in a way that uh, the service mission isn't incidental. Every university worldwide has this as one of its central missions alongside teaching and research and so forth. And finally, for higher education, reputation, it, you, you live and die by reputation. So um, the fact that you've seen the explosion of MOOCs was partially the result of individual faculty looking at reputational issues, occupying a niche in teaching as well as in research. Um, but as well, departments, uh, uh, whole universities have become uh, better known for their OER efforts than for all the other good things they do. 
It's not fair, but that's just the way it is. Uh, MIT faculty would always complain that they would go someplace on, as part of their research and people would say, oh yes, I know MIT OCW. But that's a good thing. That's a good thing that we're known Our, at UCI. We have a chemistry department already very well known, highly ranked, but now because they've produced the entire curriculum uh, uh, on YouTube, um, it's, it's far better known. And so I was just at a conference recently where somebody from Eastern Kentucky, coal country, said, oh yes, you're from UCI, I, I know Elton Chem. So I was very pleased by that. There's generic business strategies as well. And there's people who mix open and proprietary content. And so the publishers in particular will do this frequently. So they're actually beginning to integrate OER as part of a library that they can then sell the benefit of that curation along with their proprietary uh, materials. Um, curation itself is a, can, have, can be a business model. Um, so we have OERs. One of the problems is that there's now millions of OERs and they're not very well curated. It's hard to find things still. So curation itself, will, you'll find a company will say, I'll find something that really is applicable. So we just had a for-profit company that contacted us for our macroeconomics and microeconomics courses that they were going to integrate and then they sell adaptive learning products. The other thing is to, um, it, let's say you have a new category, uh, some enterprise software, but it, there's not really a big user base because who, kn who knows what this category even means? There's a lot of confusion around it. Well, increasingly companies will develop training that they release as OER for that category. So they're not very explicitly tied to their own products, but they anticipate getting a benefit once people understand the category better. Um, and finally, people can provide services on top, everything from building a full university based on OERs. There might be some gaps still, but um, you can imagine any kind of service model on top of this, uh, tutoring services, uh, you name it. All of that can come out of OERs. So there's some generic business strategies. And in K-12, it's, you know, again, reduction of textbook costs. Uh, it, in particular, the language and culture preservation becomes very, very important. Um, as I mentioned with the example of, uh, of Haiti, I would suggest that in an age where people get very confused by what they see on the internet, that digital citizenry becomes an important curricular area and it has to be open by its very nature. There's some fields you'd say just have to be open. Public health has to be open um, uh, because you can't achieve the goals of public health unless you're transmitting that information and op transmitting it openly and freely is a way to reach the mo most people. And then there's also K-12 strategies that are using it to raise quality. Um, I, I was shocked, actually, my daughter had some homework and it was IKEA branded homework. And I was like, complete, she goes to public school. And I, I was like shocked by this because there's really good materials for exactly what she was doing that are OER. And you don't, you know, IKEA was just responsible for eight deaths of children because a piece of furniture toppled over, you know? I mean, I don't know why you're selling this to, to, to children as, you know, a, a great brand. But in any case, that's, you can do uh, K-12 strategies around raising the quality of the materials being used while you're lowering costs. So I know we have only a short time, so I just want to thank you. This is my information I have to run after the session. So if you need to, just mark down my email address and I will absolutely respond. So thank you very much. I forgot well, thank the UNESCO you. point. Thank you, Larry. Our second speaker and panelist is Marin Sisden. Welcome. Thank you very much. Is this thing on? Sure is. Okay, so I've had the privilege of working for a variety of organizations, so I sort of have a variety of perspectives. First, I started in publishing, not even school publishing, but religious publishing in the Vatican. 
which where our motto was, we don't tell you to go to hell, we can actually send you there. <laughs> and then moved on from there into educational technology and now in advocacy work with e-learning journeys where we're trying to bring a variety of groups together. So I wanted to take a different spin on today's conversation just to keep it short. Um, and I'm gonna check the clock to make sure I don't run over. And that is that there is a political case and an institutional case to be made here. And I'm not gonna make it because I've heard it made by Larry, who's gonna make it far better than me and in various other panels I've been in. But let's flip the script and talk about cost effectiveness. What is the number one measure of cost effectiveness of anything? And that is whether people are using the system. Okay, everybody talks about user centric, but that's the real question when we're talking about instructional materials, when we're talking about technology platforms. Are the users in fact using the system? What is the user experience that we're attempting to provide? Not the business case, not the profitability case, not all of that. I think that very often in what we're doing, we concentrate a lot on the institution which is fine, but to give, you another, to give you another example of this, if people aren't actually in the system, then like I'm taking a course right now, and every time I get my notification from the LMS at the university that I'm at, whose name will remain nameless because they're using Moodle, but every time I get a notification from them, I dread it. I'm like, oh my God, I gotta log into this system. And, oh Jesus, I really don't want to do this. So the premise that I'm operating from is that if there's usability, what materials do you need to make the system actually usable? There's technology UX, that's another thing. And we talk about OER as if it were something new. It's not, certainly not in K through 12, which is the world that I worked in most of my career. In K through 12, there always were proprietary materials, and then there were worksheets, and then there was the supplemental stuff, and then there was stuff that Doris down the hall gave you that was user-generated content. And all of these things were mixed together in a user experience that the teacher experienced that was actually extremely effective and very easy to navigate for the teacher. Now, some of us are teachers, some of us are instructors, some are students, all of us are users. And all we really want is a system that allows us to do certain things in an effective way. OER is a huge component of that. But it is not the magic bullet. The magic bullet is whether people actually want to be there. Okay? And that makes the system cost effective. So I sought out to look for the commonalities within these different content sources, which are user generated. OER, proprietary. And I found three of them, and they have to exist within any system that you're working in. The first is that you're able to actually use all of this content in, a, in an intuitive fashion. If it's siloed, then forget it, nobody's gonna bother, okay? That's the first thing. You have to be able to mix it. Connected to this question, is the second one. And by the way, I have a slideshow. I'm not using it because there's like a thousand words on every slide, so I'm sure you'll be able to download it and get all the boring paragraphs with the green background. The second is interactivity. Instructional materials need to, to some degree, create an environment where learners are interacting for two reasons. First of all, that means they're engaged. And second of all, that means they're sending back data. If you don't have that in your system or in your OER, or for that matter, in your proprietary or your user generator or any content whatsoever, if that's something you're not considering, then you have a problem with your classroom implementation or with your university implementation. Because as we all know, if you're not clicking, you're not engaged or tapping or whatever. The third is your system needs to be interoperable. And this is a huge challenge right now because we don't have an iTunes, okay? Like, we just don't have that kind of dominant system. If you're not playing well with others, which was a huge challenge in K through 12, then you're going to have a problem. And finally, 
because I'm definitely running out of time here. I wanted to really bring to the fore something that Larry said, and we were talking at the preparation dinner about it. Every slide, every other sentence that he utters has to do with quality. It's like all over the place, right? Okay? OER is not free stuff, so you don't have to pay. Okay, there is a cost element to it. Sure, I get it. It's important. You don't want to spend money on books, certainly not a lot of money on books. It's a big problem in K-12. It's a bigger problem in higher ed. Okay. But at any rate, you really need to keep your eye on that. Because when he describes his process of OER, I wish the publishers that I worked with years ago had that process. I wish they did. Some did. Most did not. And that's what's really important, is that we're providing materials to the student because I've never seen a student or a teacher ask for OER because it's OER or proprietary or worksheets. They want their stuff that they need to teach their student so the student can learn. Thank you. Well, thank you. And up next, Adam Hallett. Yes, I think um, speaking um, in front of an international audience, I was um, thinking about, uh, Larry, what you said, and I think at first I want to make a very general remark. Being in Germany and uh, being in Europe, at least in Germany, there is a big consensus that education has to be open, just on a very general way. So it's uh, far more courageous uh, in the U.S. to say I'm in favor of open education than it is in Germany. I mean, uh, basically, if we just think of the basic model, all the public universities don't have any fees. That's kind of openness. So there's a, a huge societal conviction that uh, education has to be open, accessible, and this is working on this basic level, because I think uh, this year um, is the absolute peak, not uh, one year before, more students ever have uh, started to study in Germany. So we also see the um, result and um, the effects of this openness of education. So I think <clears throat> that's a good starting point in the political area, that there is a, a great consensus, this has to be open, basically. And I can uh, observe on the political level that there is also, therefore, um, more and more conviction. We have to look at the circumstances and the context that this will stay at, as such. So, in the research area, we can observe that there's now a lot of resistance um, yeah, against published publishers. There's a lot of political struggle um, going on, and um, I have to say there's a lot of consensus in this area, too. So, um, I think there is a lot of um, basic attitude towards openness in research and education in our cultural surrounding. But of course, if you then look closer, it's getting more complicated because we are not speaking here on the basic values towards the openness of education, but in, in a specific uh, area, in the area of digital age. And there it is getting more and more complicated. I'm head of a Institution for Distance Learning. It's the largest in Germany. 76,000 students are coming and I can uh, see on a daily basis how important it is that education is open. Open for second chance learners, uh, open for people who discover in a later point of their life that they still want to study. And this is a um, success model because the entrance barriers are not very high. But now, if we are looking at um, open educational resources in digital age, um, things are changing a little bit. There, I'm seeing the following issues. It's about, if we want to do that on a, a joint level, then it's about sharing contents. And this is something 
rather new also in the German surroundings because then I come to academia and come to the point that this using the new technologies makes only sense if we really uh, share contents and share yeah, and um, put them together and not every teacher or every professor sees him or herself as, as um, head of content. And there we are starting to get into a very the intimate area of teaching. Research has always been open, transparent. Basically, I could have a look who is doing what kind of research. Teaching is a bit different. It's um, not too polite or not expected that you will enter the next classroom and have a look what your colleague is teaching. So uh, there's a lot of reluctance in that, and I've been in that business for 20 years, but I see things now uh, changing um, because the, even the scholars which are reluctant are now thinking and trying to gather at least around certain, uh, along certain core disciplines what can we do to share contents, so to make this more effective in a way. In uh, North Rhine-Westphalia, which is a big county of Germany, uh, we have an initiative called Digital Higher Education, where we um, gather 14 all, all higher education institutions in one platform, thinking how can we work together in that. And in that area, suddenly, I mean, it's a lot about management and infrastructure and processes and so on, but it's also about teaching and learning. And suddenly there are big projects starting. How can we uh, really set, set, uh, set up some uh, content sharing initiatives? And this is a difference. This has not been possible 10 years ago. So um, I think I see a certain uh, progress in that respect. But of course, I think in uh, this openness movement, if it should get deeper into academia, that's a critical point. And another critical point, I say, if I'm as a professor are not the master of the content, what am I then? So it's getting so critical with one's self-image. Uh, and we all know, and we had it also this morning, that a uh, new arrangement of blended learning means that we have to think, very sharply think, of differentiated roles of the teachers and the facilitators of teaching and learning. And this is the second hard point, in my view, because um, we haven't concepts of academic scholarships that honor this role of arranging the learning process. It honors and appreciates the role of delivering the content, of uh, being the, uh, the one developing this. And if we want to have that in a bigger scale, I think this will be another critical factor we are thinking a lot more about, so differentiated roles of scholarship and how we can uh, support that in a very traditional academic context and surrounding. And um, maybe a last thought, we of course want to compete about those content, contents on a global level because these contents are also Cultural, culturally driven, culturally bound. So, of course, there's a discussion in Europe, how can we competitive, if we go more into um, open educational resources, and it's, um, for instance, the US has already very professional standards in that, and we only have very fragmented initiatives. So, we are trying out things but it's even within Germany, it's not possible to have one platform all uh, contribute. Uh, even in North Rhine-Westphalia, it will be a lot of work to say, can we set up a joint platform? And in this case, we are far away from a European level. So I also had a lot of European discussions because it would be so good 
to join forces in that area. It's, um, there were initiatives on European cinema because we said, yes, there is some, in these contents, there is uh, culture embedded. So people would far more like to join if they have the impression my culture, not only national, but also teaching culture, is still in there. So um, this is on the political level, on the European level, uh, something we have to deal with because we are very fragmented, a high diversity of cultures. But of course, if I look from it from a global perspective, this will weaken the European position and therefore we have to think how, how to do that also on a larger scale. So these are only some thoughts from my side and I hope we get now into the discussion and, um, yeah, to hear more about your views on that. Thank you very much. Well, thank you to all three of you. And maybe before we open up it up to you in the audience, um, and please do tackle us with questions, I have one question that I wanted to direct to the three of you. Um, and we've, we've heard lots about open and strategy and also arguments for open or for a certain strategy and for the digital. Um, I'd be interested in your very different context from what I can tell, what role the actual learners play in the development of that strategy. So how do you enable participation? How do you foster that? And also how do you integrate that in those debates that can admittedly be quite policy driven or cost driven even? Um, so I'd be very interested in, in your take on that. Do you want me to start? Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. So um, I would say that one of the uh, uh, big uh, short-sighted mistakes that we made in the early days of open education, we called it open courseware or open educational resources, was that we were not taking into account the perspective of the learner in the creation of resources. So the open, open courseware specifically was a byproduct of what a faculty member was producing anyway for their students. And so the, the, if there was a learner in mind, it was that very specific context. And so to take it out of that context became very difficult. So even if you had a course in the, the sciences from MIT, it doesn't mean that students at other institutions could readily learn from that because there was an assume, excuse me, there was an assumed level of the students that was different than most places, much less our community colleges, technological universities, technical schools. It, it was quite different circumstance. The MOOCs actually helped us to think about the fact that these resources have to be curated in such a way that they appear as courses. And in the same way that our courses are designed with learners in mind, we have to develop uh, open courses in the same way for audiences that may exist worldwide, but we take for granted then a specific level. We're teaching from that level so that we're helping them move from what the point that they're, that they're currently at to where we want them to go. And so that's one of the ways in which we're trying to adapt, and it wasn't true at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Byron, you spoke a great deal about usability and, and that that's kind of what triggered the question to a certain extent. Well, yeah, I mean, so let's take a look at it from the point of view of the learner as a user, right? Okay, and so everybody in here is a user right now. There's people who are using their computers and some aren't, and it's my job to provide engaging content that's going to get them to not use their computer, right? I mean, that's, that, that may actually yep. be actionable and in some way interesting, or not. Um, <clears throat> sure, it's standards-based and it's different in universities and in schools, but not so much because in a user-centric world, there's no way that you're going to stop anybody from doing that, okay, anywhere. So schools are just like K through 12 schools are just a collection of kids on their second cell phones because they had to surrender their first one, okay? So they got the second one under the desk. Oh, yeah, when I went to schools, it was shocking. It was like a bus station in there. Um, and they're going to do what they're going to do. And, but there's other places where there were classrooms where kids actually took their cell phones and stacked them up openly and said, okay, we want to actually listen to what's going on here. 
If you're going to be learner-centric, there always has to be, you're right, there was a lack of focus on actually putting yourself in the shoes of the student. But it's very difficult to do that in, a, in, a, in an intergenerational world, and we need to really concentrate on that. So, again, it's not the size of the room, or it's, it's whether people are actually engaging with what it is that you're doing. In this room, there might be an engagement rate of X, okay? But I don't remember, I don't remember the great materials I read. Mm -hmm. I remember the people who provided those materials, okay? What, in some cases, videos, by the way, asynchronous, mm -hmm. okay? Like, it wasn't in person. Um, but keeping that in mind, I think, would really, would really help a lot. And uh, consumer products do that all the time, consumer technology products. It would not hurt for us to steal a little bit from that. Yes, yeah. exactly. And I think we started this morning um, with some thoughts, what is good learning about? And if we take that serious, I mean, how is knowledge created? If you believe in a more constructivistic view, then it's about interaction. So knowledge can only be created jointly. And now even business shows us with prosumer uh, context. Not imparted, but created. Yes. Yes. But, and I think in education, we really have to think that knowledge is an generating in an interactive procedure and processes. And so um, all the new, um, make the technologies, social media, give us now the possibility to do that also in larger groups. So to have feedback loops, to have interactions, not only in the small group in the classroom as the classical seminar, but we could do that on a larger scale. And the, the whole new media have a heavy weight on peers and I mean, look at Wikipedia, what a wonderful instrument. I mean, so many persons contributing. So we should open our contents up and so that a lot of people can contribute, give feedback, criticize, and develop also material further. But um, so interaction must be at the core of it. And um, I think we can also integrate a lot of feedback into materials. But the overall educational experience is not the MOOC, is not the content. It's the pedagogical design of this. And if there, are not, if there is not heavy weight laid on interaction, it won't be good education. So that's at the core of it. And Speaking. I think the first uh, MOOCs were about sending, sending, like in former times, and then after the first step, oh, we all realized that's not enough. That is not... So in that sense, we will stop now in sending. And I was going to say, speaking of interactiv interactivity, any questions from the audience or comments, remarks, anything? Otherwise, we'll just keep on going. There's one question over there. There's a mic on its way. Good, good afternoon. Um, my name is Peter Becker. I'm from Holland, from uh, The Hague University of Applied Sciences. Uh, I'm a lecturer there, and I'm quite fascinated by open education. Uh, but I will always hear when we have discussions and presentations like these, um, it's almost about uh, sh sharing and uh, make, uh, making our content open. But we do that with a goal, uh, which is reuse not only by learners, but also by other teachers, other lecturers, to, to use materials from others. Um, so I think there's a distinction between inside out, sharing, and outside in, mm -hmm. reusing others' materials. Um, and what I, what I see, uh, when I talk with my fellow uh, lecturers, they uh, are not well known with the concept of open education. And I always thought, well, if they discover what other institutions and uh, lectures make and they see that the benefit of it, then they will be more willing to share themselves. Uh, when I hear you discussing, I think, well, it could also be, uh, be the other way around by force teachers to share. They might see uh, how this world looks like of open education, see what others have done, etc., and get involved in the, 
in the materials that is that are available. So, what's your opinion about it? To uh, encourage lecturers to use materials from others, mm -hmm. because that's what we're doing it for. I'm not gonna go. You go ahead. Sorry. So, uh, I, I think we also have a, a design problem to address, um, which is that part of the issue of not taking something that someone else has created is based on the fact that that's that person's ideas. I have my own ideas. It doesn't quite fit. But we're really, uh, it's, it's almost amazing to me that, that we still don't create courses as communities. Yeah. That is, now open education needs to move into a new phase in which courses are created not just deliberately with a good learning design, but also as a, as a matter of debate among people who are, who are, this is not only their area of expertise, but they're passionate about this subject, and that the result of the, this, this uh, clash of ideas in the creation of the course itself is going to be richer than anything that we have either on the MOOC side or as open educational resources. And so that, to me, once we see, okay, this community of a thousand people, a thousand physicists, a thousand people in humanities that were working on this pro project, and by the way, it becomes easier because every person spends 10 hours. No one has to spend 200 hours. Um, if we get to that point, then the idea that I'm adopting somebody else's materials becomes less than, it'll be even better than textbooks that we see right now that have good editors, but usually one, two, three authors, and it's a relatively limited point of view that can necessarily go into a single textbook. So now professors have to judge this and that. So I think that we have to see a future phase of open education and MOOCs as well. Marin. I'm gonna take actually the, I always like to hook onto a word, community. Um, all education is open. Materials may be copyrighted or not, but if I hear something interesting in my course that I'm taking next week, then I'm going to share it in a community. I've done it many times. Somebody else may be educated from that. Diplomas cost money, usually. Materials may be copyrighted. But the sooner we understand that in a social world and in a community world, education, if what you say Okay, so I define education as making sense of information to increase knowledge. I didn't actually make that up, of course, but I heard it. And if I make sense of something to increase knowledge, I share it. And then when I share it, other people share it. And I'm contributing to the process of education through a community. That is education. That is not the same thing as a diploma or a copyright. And the sooner we understand that, the sooner we'll be able to open up to this new to, to, it's not a new world, it just, it is. This is what it is. I mean, you're addressing a real problem. There's a saying in Germany that a professor would rather use his colleague's toothbrush than his course material. <laughs> so, you have the point. Um, but as I said before, I'm, I'm observing a slight change in that. And I think it, uh, we must uh, throw more light and give more reputation to those attempts. That scholarship and excellency is not only about producing materials, but sharing it with others and putting it in an arrangement. And if, if highly reputated teachers start with that, I think others will follow. But of course, this is a cultural change. It will take some time, but at least I can say there are some moves in the right, movements in the right direction. I would just briefly add, if I may, because this session is also about organization, I think it's also about an organization that values people making mistakes as well, when they, both when they share, but also when they adapt, so that you as an organization, as an administrator, as a leader of an institution, can try and foster that kind of culture as well. And maybe there's one more argument. The more people deal with blended learning arrangements, the more they realize how much work this is. Oh, <laughs> yeah. That this is, if you really do it on a professional way, it's, you, you need to collect forces and to share things. Otherwise, it's just too much for the single one. Mm -hmm. And that helps to collaboration sometime. 
another question to my right over here. Yes, um, thank you. I'm Sophie, University of Geneva. Uh, we are currently discussing, uh, besides OER, open access, etc., what we call open studies, uh, meaning lowering the prerequisites uh, uh, and admission criteria to access, actually, ex especially in executive education, to for for somehow enlarging the, 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 the audience who can access um, uh, certain types of courses. And there we're suddenly confronted with, um, you know, the credentials that we may give at the end and not at, uh, somehow ask for at the beginning as well. And with, uh, with a number of, of other issues related to, uh, to other providers and, and what's about the, the, you know, the competition, et cetera, et cetera. I was wondering whether you had anything to say about this, this notion of uh, accessibility for, for the public uh, with no prerequisites. Mm -hmm. I think, Larry, you spoke about the service mission of an institution to, to some extent. Does that... I, I think that the general point I would raise is that universities used to be gatekeepers of knowledge. You know, within our walls, we contained all of it. And if you wanted uh, uh, access to that knowledge, you had to gain admission. And so the whole idea of open enrollment uh, is, is a piece of democratization of, of education uh, to start with. But then this whole idea of knowledge is, to me, it's a common heritage of humanity, the knowledge that we've created. And it should, of course, all be openly available regardless of which institution is putting it out. And hopefully we can generate, we would generate even a, a better competition among universities to produce more interesting courses, more uh, better pathways for learners and so forth. So I, I, there's a little bit of an echo in the room. I think I am answering the, qu the question correctly, but I'm not sure. I think so. What, what rang a bell for me, and maybe, maybe you could just go into that for just like another one or two sentences, was I saw from your Twitter timeline that you were in Ljubljana to the OER Congress. And I remember that the output, I'm not sure if everybody's familiar with that, but they're, the, one of the documents that, was the, that were the output of that Congress was the Ljubljana Action Plan on OER. And I remember that there was one challenge and one action that they defined where you deliberately look and communicate with other communities like open access and like open science and so forth and try and find those overlaps? I mean, the, we talked about governmental uh, actions and UNESCO assembled at this meeting 15 ministers of education as well as about 300 other people. Um, and, um, and the idea was to go from the standpoint to achieve sustainable development goals of the United Nations that open education was a key uh, mechanism for getting there. Um, and they wanted the, they had had a previous Congress in 2012 that uh, urged people to adopt policies so that if public money is used, then those materials should be available to the benefit of the entire public. They, this one was focused on action items and er, encouraged um, governments to as, as, as specifically address the mechanisms for uh, implementation of open education strategies in their own countries. And some like Slovenia are very advanced. That's where the conference was, so no accident. Um, they have a whole national strategy about how you develop uh, uh, digital citizens, how uh, computer skills, open education, et cetera, from kindergarten on uh, are, uh, are important. Um, and so they have a full national plan, but we have a long way to go to get other countries to really adopt those as a model and put resources behind it, put public funding behind that. Mark, I, yeah. I, I'm not going to stray too far into the realm of politics, I promise. But the idea of OE, of open education, is relatively recent. The idea of open education, primary and secondary, is not thousands, but hundreds of years old. The idea of open education going into tertiary and vocational and lifelong is even more current than that and probably wouldn't have even become a thing without technology and communities. There are a variety of forces out there that don't want that today, okay? And we need to be very vigilant 
to distinguish the fact that we can talk to each other from the fact that we have the right to learn what we want to learn, okay? That right is recent, it's innate, and it needs to be protected. Because I can, I'm not gonna bother rattling off 10 situations where that's not the case, okay? Some of them here in Europe, some of them where I live in Poland. So, you know, keeping that in mind and maintaining that connection in your head between that and the materials that we create, I think will give us a much better sense of mission as to why it is that we're doing this. We're not doing this just to teach, teach kids algebra. Mm -hmm. That's not the point. They can learn that without us. And I think this accessibility issue is really an important one. Um, I have a lot to do with lifelong learners. And I think, the, so in later life maybe, then I always observe uh, they have to forget about their school experience <laughs> because somehow that's related to blood, sweat and tears. Learning is blood, sweat and tears. And so uh, to connect them to a new world of learning is so important but because if we take that serious and we have to, lifelong learning, then they will only... Um, do that if uh, it's not blood, sweat and tears only. And so we have to think as institutions, how can we be accessible, seduce a lot of people to get involved again. So that's a societal demand. And on the other side, it's also about uh, democratization. Yeah, it's a certain paradigm shift. So knowledge is not something secret, some a small group of men is hiding somewhere, but it's open to us all. But this um, places quite a lot of pressure because suddenly this all is open and transparent. And this is also um, a cultural challenge, as I said before, yeah. There's a question over there, perfect. Uh, Paul, Paul Baxich uh, from uh, Sheffield. And and as far as ICDE is concerned, an OER policy advocate. Um, so my question comes from, from many years uh, in, the, in that area. I've, I've been interested to hear sort of, you know, one line takeaways from the panel about what we can do to accelerate this, uh, this process. I mean, I'm going to a session later on today on the Millennium Development Goals. I think if someone sat, stood up and said, we've got to wait for cultural change to educate all our children, um, they, wouldn't get, they wouldn't get far. These things cost money and effort. And I think there is a, a, great, a great deal of, of money and effort needed, and more, more than it's getting. But it can't, it can't be as simple as money, because I think we've tried that, and most countries seem to um, find that too difficult for whatever reason. So I think we've got to find some subtler interventions, and, but it's got to be more than cultural change. I don't think we, can, we and, and our community can afford to wait. One thought I have is, I wonder if um, it's, it's worth thinking about a change of name. I mean, reflecting on the, on the open source movement, I do wonder, in fact, if, if the, the countries that called it free and libre uh, were actually onto something. I think as soon as you call it open, my experience in talking to policy people, especially in the north of, of Europe, is they get quite bewildered. They say, but we've got an open university, it's open, can you go away now? essentially. I think we've got to find some term which makes it a bit clearer of what we're trying to achieve. Um, otherwise, people, people can get, get very confused. Same thing with free. You know, nothing is ever free. Someone's paying and someone's paying for the mobile phone and the data network and the bandwidth. So, which in a, in a poor country in Africa is a significant sum, even if what's at the end of the line is free. So, I much prefer the phrase low cost, or following commission examples, lower cost, giving you a kind of value judgment and a sense of direction. So maybe it's time for opening up the vocabulary and, and somehow finding a way of accelerating it uh, rather than buying the answer, which I think isn't going to work. Right. So we have a labeling problem. Oh, no, you want... No. I think. Oh, you mean I for, think the, Larry... for the takeaway? I'm sorry, yeah. I got so used to going second that. Uh, <laughs> no, I was I was thinking about what you were saying, and I mean, what we need to take away, because I'm going to go back to the beginning of what of what you've said, and that is, what what should be our takeaway from this? 
Our takeaways should be two words, uh, always learning. Unfortunately, I'm not going to mention the name of the publisher that appropriated that as part of their tagline, because I resent it, because it shouldn't be copyrighted or trademarked. But that's the question we always need to ask ourselves, OK? Are we always learning? Are our students always learning? Are our workers, employees, whoever it is, it doesn't matter. I need a course in algebra, OK? I'm 57 years old. I need a course in algebra. To me, that's not a ninth grade course, OK? That's something that I need to be learning. In fact, I'm taking a course in algebra. It's going very badly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but you know, if we can answer that question in today's world of huge amounts of information, OK, of which we are not the gatekeepers, as you said, then I think we're going in the right direction. If we can't answer that question, yes, are we always learning or are they always learning, then we're going in the wrong direction. It's a simple question, really. So, so I think that the, the key will be that there is an increasingly an informal learning sector, the same way that we always have had formal schools, the ability of students and non-students to participate and to cross over into each other's worlds. It seems to me that's one of the uh, ways in which we want people to become digital citizens, that they understand learning in both of those contexts, that uh, the uh, proposal I always make at my own university is that um, if we have a course, we have one course, for example, called Inequalities. And that course should, be, should have a component in which the students, as their project, must participate in an online forum and, and attempt to lead, understand the community that's, that's there, but also attempt to lead it in some way and to write up what they're thinking about that. But increasingly, that kind of thinking can also be applied. Same way that, you know, MOOC started with the idea of big peer groups. And I don't like the way that they have peer leaders because it's just a question and answer peer leader. But, but we can have communities where people actually engage with each other. And that should be the next phase, the next goal of what we're doing. I think your question also points to the uh, financial surrounding or the financial model that we apply in education. And that uh, differs a lot um, only within Europe. I mean, in the British context, it's uh, probably much more difficult since education is more seen as a business. So you have to think about how to finance that if you're having ideas like open educational resources. In the German context, I see, for instance, we have a free education for the bachelor and master. But what happens from the age of 25 to the age of 70 is also in seen as a more entrepreneurial model. And so the individual should find his or her way um, to do some continuing education. Or maybe the employer should pay. And this works, but on the uh, societal perspective, we should not forget that then only the eager ones, the already interested ones, will move. And um, we will uh, have a lack of certain competences in the society as such. Because if you, you want to address certain target groups, you have to think about the incentives if they are not coming voluntarily. And I think this is on the agenda, because if we're living in a digital age, how can we uh, provide on a large scale the competences we all need, whether rich or poor, whether well-educated or not? And this, this is a challenge in that area that link, is linked to your question, I think. So to add a challenge, I think we have just about a minute left. And if there are no pressing, pressing questions from the audience, I think we should leave it at that. Uh, I think a couple of us are a bit more approachable than others. Some have to catch trains, some don't. Um, but I'd like to thank you, um, thank you all for uh, taking the time for talking to us and, for, and also to you for the interesting questions and the engaging session. Thank you.